Good morning. I'm Elon Dancy, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Helen S. Faison Endowed Chair in Urban Education and Executive Director for the Center for Urban Education in the School of Education at the University of Pittsburgh. Thanks for being with us this morning. If you're new to the Pitt Center for Urban Education, we focus on education praxis for freedom and justice through a range of creative and intellectual endeavors, perhaps most notably research, teaching, and service. We thank our colleagues in the Center for Urban Education and the School of Education, our faculty, staff, and students whose labor enabled this event. And we give a special thanks to our co-sponsors, the University of Pittsburgh Library System, the August Wilson African American Cultural Center, and the Kenlock Commons for critical pedagogy and leadership located in our own School of Education. Our apologies for the absence of ASL support with this event due to staffing issues. We'll transcribe this talk and make available to all our registrants. We always want you to know that there's a way to keep in touch with center events as well at our website, q.pit.edu. That's cue.pitt.edu. You can click contact on our main menu to receive information about our events. While you're there, learn more about us, what is upcoming, and read our newsletter. We're gathered today in the synergies of exciting celebration. The first is the opportunity to study the educational philosophy of playwright and Pittsburgh Hill District native August Wilson, whose trailblazing cycle of 10 plays chronicle the 20th century Black experience in what is known as North America. Each play is set in a different decade and collectively became known as the century cycle. Put them all together, Wilson once said, and you have a history. At a time when several communities are engaging Black History Month in various ways, we take this opportunity to learn from Wilson's life and work as essential to teaching and learning. Because his creations help us to gain better understanding of our practices in educational contexts, because it helps us articulate our desired principles and commitments for a world yet to exist, and because it helps us to understand organize and act. Second, we celebrate our relationship with the University of Pittsburgh Library and announce our collaborative partnership to offer workshops in which any educator can learn how to design experiences through the August Wilson Archive, which now lives in the University Library. Details are forthcoming on both our websites. And if you have registered for this event, you will receive a special invitation. And third, you know, how meaningful to celebrate this collaboration than with the wonderful conversation we are about to have with a panel of thoughtful uh, intellectuals and creatives. I now welcome Dial Thomas, who is curator for uh, the August Wilson Outreach and Engagement Unit within the University Library System Archives and Special Collections. She is going to share more about the treasure chest that is the August Wilson Archive. Dial, good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much for that introduction, Elon. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dial Thomas. I am the August Wilson Outreach and Engagement Curator in the University of Pittsburgh Library System. I'm so excited for our conversation today and for this partnership with the Center for Urban Education. Um, so I'm just going to share a few more details about the archive and our outreach plans with it. So in the fall of 2020, the University Library System acquired the August Wilson Archive from his estate and his widow, Costanza Romero Wilson. The archive arrived in 450 plus boxes, yes, on an 18-wheeler truck. It chronicles Wilson's writing career from early unpublished works through his American Century Cycle plays. It contains handwritten notes, drafts of scripts, production history, speeches, essays, correspondence, awards, degrees, photographs, audiovisual materials, and much more. Um, I don't think I have to say this, but Wilson's work has been amazingly influential and impactful, not just in Pittsburgh, but across this country and the world. And we know that the archive is a treasure trove for exploring not only Wilson's writing process, how he developed characters, dialogue, plot, but also issues important to him, his creative and personal relationships, and even the practicality of how his plays were produced from contracts, casting, script edits. We are now focused on working with our local community to create, learn, and be inspired by what what is in the collection. We also hope to initiate conversations on race, African American history, the Great Migration, social justice, and much more, with this conversation being the first of many. 
Um, so my role is focused on outreach to local high school students, educators, artists, and community organizations. My goal is to keep Wilson's legacy as well as the Black experience chronicled in his plays alive for current and future generations. Wilson tells the story of the Black experience and the struggle for cultural and economic preservation through the lens of the Hill District. Our programs will leverage the existing Pitt Community Engagement Centers in both the Hill District and Homewood, also leveraging our existing partnerships with the August Wilson House, the August Wilson African American Cultural Center, the August Wilson Society, University Prep Malines, Pitt Center for Creativity, Department of English, and University Educational Outreach Center. We're also forging new relationships with the Center of Life, the Hazelwood Historical Society, Bloomfield Garfield Corporation, the Hill CDC, the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh, the City of Pittsburgh, and of course, Pitt Center for Urban Education. These relationships allow us to form partnerships for programming and events, reach interested communities, and enrich our offerings. With a strength-based approach, we will work with many of these community organizations to plan specialized programming. The last thing that I want to highlight is that the archive is open for research now. It opened in early January um, and many of um, our panelists today actually have already visited the archive, which is so very exciting. Um, we have welcomed academic researchers and several student researchers. Um, and we hope to continue to hold research and creative projects to contribute to a body of work around Wilson and our understanding of his corpus. We have um, an opening celebration for the archive next week, March 3rd, in Hillman Library from 6 to 8 p.m., along with a week's long of programming. So I hope to see you there, and I hope to see you at the archive. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the conversation. Yes, thank you, Daya. Absolutely exciting. Uh, now, without further delay, let's get to our panel. Uh, please welcome our wonderful facilitators, Ariana Brazier, received her doctoral degree in English, Critical and Cultural Studies from the University of Pittsburgh in April 2021. As a researcher, Ari's work is centered on Black children and families living in poverty in the Southeast United States. She documents how Black child play functions as a grassroots method of community-based storytelling, teaching, and organizing. And she's joined today by Robert Randolph, who is director of the Writing Center at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. His research and teaching interests include 20th and 21st century African-American literature and cultural production, sociocultural foundations of education, and Black feminist and queer rhetorics and pedagogies. His notable publications include The Queer Poetics of Social Justice, Literacy, Affection, and the Critical Pedagogical Imperative, and Shifting the Talk, Writing Studies, Rhetoric, and Feminism, at HBCUs. Welcome. Excited. Thank you, Elon. I am going to just frame our conversation today. Um, with his American Century Cycle, August Wilson is one of the most significant American playwrights of the 20th century. Beyond richly drawn characters, poetic language, and artistic merit, Wilson's works also serve as a pedagogical tool for many, helping to educate and inspire individuals, particularly African Americans, in their pursuit for self-determination and social justice. Overall, this multifaceted discussion will highlight the enduring impact of Wilson's plays and their continued relevance in shaping our understanding of race, identity, and social justice in America. And so I welcome all of our great, um, our esteemed panelists, and I will begin with a question here, and any one of you can jump in and share your thoughts. And the question is, to what extent do August Wilson's plays promote the idea of self-determination as a means of achieving personal and collective freedom and liberation for African-Americans? <laughs> Don't all jump in at once. <laughs> I'll, I'll, just, I'll start us off. I just- um... Thank you. What comes to mind um, in thinking about Wilson's plays, um, uh, Seth, the character from Joe Turner's Come and Gone, um, you know, he's the boarding house owner. He's a property owner, a proprietor in 1911. Um, and he has this skill to um, make something out of nothing is what he says, and to take metal in particular and bend it and twist it. And he says, I can do whatever. Um, I want with it. Um, and, you know, it's, 
you know, captures this sense of self-determination at this kind of um, uh, pivotal moment in African-American history, um, the nadir um, and the nader. He has a dream of not only working for himself, but of teaching other black men um, his metal craft work so that um, they can all work together alongside him. Um, so there's this individual dream kind of leading to this collective outcome. Um, and so, you know, that moment in the play, but also kind of um, what Wilson did with the century cycle itself is this, you know, sheer act of determination. Thank you. Right. I can jump in and follow up. Um, Sean, thank you for that. Um, you know, the, the thing that comes to mind immediately for me is that August Wilson, you know, by writing his template cycle, and in addition to that, you know, his speeches, right, and his critical commentary, um, he's sort of, you know, you know, urging folks, and in particular, Black folks, to own the narrative, right? Um, in many ways, he's, you know, sort of asserting the idea that we need to own our narrative, and in doing so, we insert ourselves into discourses about history. And not only do we insert ourselves into the discourses, but we also get to participate in revising narratives, right? Mm -hmm. And historical documents through dramatic literature that have often sort of erased, silenced, or really just sort of, you know, uh, were problematic in the ways in which they've attempted to, you know, document and address, you know, who Black folks are in our experiences, right? Um, and, you know, following up a little bit on Sean, thinking about a play in particular, I'm thinking about um, The Piano Lesson, which is the play that's set in the 1930s. Um, interesting, in that play, you know, it is about a brother and sister, um, and they're sort of, you know, having a struggle about what to do with the family's legacy that is embodied in the piano, right, that was used to purchase um, family members during the period of enslavement. Um, but I think, you know, if we look closer at some of the other characters, and in particular, Boy Willie, who is the central character, um, and we also look at Lyman, who is, you know, his best friend, who travels with him from the South to the North, Pittsburgh in particular, and we look at those two characters, and they sort of are offering us sort of, you know, um, divergent ideas and possibilities for this notion of self-determination. Boy Willie wants to take the piano, he wants to sell it, and he wants to use the money to return to the South right and invest it in sort of um you know uh, uh in, in an entrepreneurial way um where Lyman does not actually want to return to the south he wants to go up north and follow the folks who've you know moved to the north and create new opportunities right now essentially August Wilson argues that neither one of them are right neither one of them are wrong but the goal is to sort of deal with the 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 history and legacy of African Americans, uh, particularly around the period of enslavement, before we can move forward, right? But I think it's interesting that he's offering us a variety of possibilities for what it means to move forward in an already um, problematic world, right? Um, and I'll leave it there for that for now. Yeah, I think that so much of of August Wilson's work is though about um, providing a perspective of black people that inherently black people are self-reliant, you know, that, that that's, that's kind of one of the, the lenses of, of, of his plays. So that, I mean, if we really look at it, well, all his characters are self-reliant, you know? I mean, and even characters that if looked at from another lens, a, a character like say maybe Hambone in, in Two Trains Running, who's just kind of a, a homeless guy who's just walking around the street saying, I want my ham, but he's still, he's pursuing, he's trying to, to claim his own destiny, you know, is the way of one might look at him and say, oh, oh, he's just a shiftless homeless bum or something, you know what I'm saying? But to, August Wilson very carefully reveals the self-reliance that's kind of inherent in all of these black people in this world that, that that's dominated kind of white, by, by white supremacy with ever, without ever really like centering whiteness or white supremacy. Before, thank you all for those. Before we continue, I neglected to introduce you, my esteemed panelists. Ah, blame, <laughs> blame it on my head and not my heart. So Justin, 
Emeka is an associate professor of theater and African-American studies at Oberlin College and resident director at the Pittsburgh Public Theater, where he directed August, August Wilson's Two Trains Running in 2022, and most recently, A Midsummer Night's Dream in Harlem. He specializes in new approaches to classic texts and imaginative stagings, imaginative stagings of popular and emerging playwrights. Dr. Khalid Y. Long is an assistant professor in the Department of Theater and Film Studies and, and the Institute at the Institute for African American Studies at the University of Georgia. He is a scholar, dramaturg, and director specializing in African American Black diasporic theater performance and literature through the lenses of Black feminist, womanist thought, queer studies, and performance studies. He previously served as the August Wilson Society's Vice President and Conference Planner. And lastly, Dr. Sean Myers is an Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh, who specializes in African-American diasporic literature and culture, focusing on Black aesthetics, transit, and transnationalism, and Black feminist literary histories. Her current book project, Black Anesthetics, African-American Narrative Beyond Man, explores post-humanism in African-American literature. Thank you. All right, let's continue. We'd Can also I like to, oh, we'd also like to invite all participants to post any questions they may have in the chat, and we will reserve plenty of time at the conclusion of our questions, mine and Robert's, for you all. I think Wait. she has the next question, Ari. Okay, wasn't sure, I was waiting for the cue. Okay, <laughs> so August Wilson is quoted as saying, quote, all art is political in the sense that it serves someone's politics, end quote. What do you think of this quote in light of the underfunding of arts classes due to educational budget cuts and recent book bans due to fear mongering around critical race theory? I also have a sub question to that and I'll pose that as well. And then my second question is how do we foster an interest in art as a tactic for resistance and cultural celebration amidst this political climate? I, I can jump in here and offer some beginning thoughts. I'm actually really, really interested in the second portion of the question. Um, and for me, um, you know, I believe that a strategy is to continue to teach it. We have to continue to teach art, right? And what I mean by that is we do not, you know, oftentimes we teach art, we're teaching it sort of as an addendum, right? Um, we're teaching it as, you know, sort of on the periphery, right? And it's not often sort of the central, you know, sort of centered in the curriculum. And I think that we have to begin to sort of rethink that. And I'm talking about in terms of, you know, from grade school to higher education um, as well, right? Um, you know, and if we continue, if we put it in the center, then that really forces us to, in students and parents, right, to rethink the purpose of the arts, right? And the possibilities that the art offers, right? And I'm not talking about in terms of teaching art, um, in all of its manifestations, simply for students to, to promote or to sort of a, a, you know, attempt to push students to go into the arts as a career, right? But I'm talking about teaching art as a way to get students to explore deeply the human condition, right? To get them to explore history and culture, right? Of various groups of people and not just Black folks, but obviously we're talking about Black folks today with August Wilson, right? And then let's use August Wilson as an example. If we put August Wilson at the center of the curriculum, right? Whether that's in English, whether that's in theater, right? Performance studies, whether that's in sociology, and I'm naming, you know, areas that have taken him up, right? And their various, you know, uh, discourses and so forth, right? Um, it then allows us to put Black folk at the center of the discourses and Black folks at the center of the curriculum. And so for me, that is sort of a, a, um, a strategy that can be implemented um, that have been on, on many people's part, yeah. I'll um, jump in to um, say how much I appreciate how Wilson is kind of um, parsing out the, you know, political versus um, seemingly apolitical art. Um, you know, he's betraying the lie that certain art traditions are non-political or apolitical. 
um, you know, all art is advancing or upholding some type of worldview or a set of social relations or some type of political structure. So, you know, um, there were certain uh, points in his career where he said, my art is not explicitly political, um, but, you know, all art is animated um, by, you know, either conditions of power or some type of contest of power. Um, and thinking about the underfunding of the arts, I'm, I'm speaking here, you know, not only as an educator, but as a parent that, you know, when we underfund art classes, we're underfunding um, children's imagination and creativity. Um, when you're cutting access to music and visual arts and literature and drama and dance, you're eliminating entire ways of thinking and feeling um, and relating and moving through the world. Um, what are thinking about, you know, just you turn the news on every day. So this is kind of a problem we're contending with on a daily basis. But, you know, looking to um, uh, the Black Horizons Theater and those types of things. I grew up in Cleveland. We had the Karamu House, um, just those community places, um, our home bookshelves. Um, you know, we have to lean on those things again. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the idea of all art being pro political for me, um, you know, as, as August Wilson talks about it, is a is a lot one the recognition that uh, you know all art comes from a, a unique perspective you know and that um it, it somewhat indicts the idea of what is universal you know there's this kind of idea that some art is universal and some is, is kind of peripheral or you know in terms of like black theater versus theater you know and I, I think that August Wilson at, at one level, you know, is kind of in, indicting this idea of, of what is what we kind of consider as just universal, whether this idea like Shakespeare is universal and, and you know, Chekhov is universal, whereas Intezaki Shange is more specified and more special, specialty, specialized, you know, um, in, in the idea that that at one level, I, I think that that August Wilson kind of is asserting like, for me, as, as I take it anyway, is that what is universal is not the art. The, what is universal is, is the people and the experiences. So love is universal. Pain is universal. Struggle is universal. Shakespeare is not universal. August Wilson is not universal. Nobody is like universal and they're able to just reach everybody as much as they create pictures and portraits of a human experience that reaches everybody. Then we start achieving what's getting at what's universal as opposed to political. Wow, okay. So y'all are opening up with the big guns here, okay. <laughs> and this actually, so your comments also lead to the next um, question, which is more poignant here. Um, aligning with key themes of Wilson's life and work, how does viewing oneself as a part of his cultural and artistic lineage embolden students to see their own contributions as equally political and therefore political? Well, I, I think that one, he, you know, he, his work kind of um, forces us to confront certain deficiencies of, of legacies, you know, that, that Black people in America are working uphill, are, are, are working uphill against forces that are that have been designed to keep them in a certain place, you know, and paramount to that struggle is self awareness, you know, and so just as much as the original question saying, you know, August Wilson was concerned with self reliance just as much or even more so he was concerned with self awareness and this idea yeah. of black people being Africans in America, which is still a very controversial idea, you know, but uh, August Wilson promoted that idea to the hill that we are African people in America, you know, that even black people in America push back 
on, you know, but to connect us to a greater legacy, you know, going back to the to, to the black nationalists, Malcolm X and uh, Marcus Garvey, this this idea that we're connected, we come from a, a larger source of history than just these slave ships that dropped us off in the, in the 1600s, you know, and so important in order for us to for young people to kind of understand their true power and their true purpose is to be able to connect with those roots that go further back, reaching back beyond America even. And he uses his art, his plays as a tool to, to kind of shine that light in that direction. Thank you. Um, can you speak more about, um, like, can you give us a couple of examples from specific plays where he is? Uh, particularly taking up this question of self-awareness. I mean, every almost every every single one of them have have. I mean, of course, Harold Loomis, you know, and it's it, starting at the top. He's 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 plagued by you know not knowing who he is in the world, and it's the song that actually helps him figure out who he is so that the art is then becomes a conduit for us to remember the essence. Of, of who we are, you know, I mean it's it's on Esther who takes a uh, citizen on on a journey to the city to the city of bones at the bottom of the ocean again metaphorically, though, you know it's it's an artistic journey it's a poetic journey that she uses so so August Wilson throughout his plays is time and time again is showing us how art is is the the highway the vehicle the avenue that we can get on and ride towards self awareness and kind of and black pride and African pride. I also think that it is important, right, to think about you know we're we're we're, we're you know the this idea of self determination is sort of the thread throughout today's chat, right? But I think it's important to bring in. August Wilson's argument around the idea of community and investing in community, right? So even though, you know, we can name specific characters or individual characters from, you know, the plays within the cycle, right? It is important to recognize that in each of his plays, the characters are connected to a larger community, right? And it is through the community that the characters are able to survive, right? Or to be successful, right? At the, you know, attempts that they're making throughout various plays, right? Um, uh, yeah, that, I just wanted to, you know, bring that in for a moment, yeah. Um, and then I think in, in the context of, you know, you know, getting students to see their own contributions, right? I think it's important then for students to recognize that nothing exists, nothing happens without being connected to a larger community. Even though people like to think that, 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 that they're moving throughout the world alone and by themselves, right? Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. I'll just say, um, you know, I mentioned before that I'm, I'm from Cleveland, so not having come here to live um, in Pittsburgh until, you know, um, working at the University of Pittsburgh, but marrying into a Pittsburgh family that I felt like I knew Pittsburgh before I ever arrived or ever dreamed of living here. And, and I think that's what um, August Wilson, that's his inheritance. That's what he has left us, that, you know, he has honored the streets that we walk on. He has elevated the family and the community ties that we have. Um, he sees the art in our language and he, you know, says that it is artful. Like that is the legacy. So, you know, that's the source of a self-awareness that we have that, um, you know, it particularly resonates um, what he did um, for the city that I'm going to honor you across an entire century, um, the politics of your everyday life, your everyday language. It is, um, um, you know, there's an eloquence there. When you all have taught Wilson's works or um, engaged his works with students or at various levels, do the students talk about um, or actually, I'll just ask, what do the students talk about? Do they have a kind of political analysis, as it were, about their connection to Wilson's work? Uh, 
You know, it's interesting because many, you know, a lot of my students, you know, I teach at University of Georgia and prior to that I was at Columbia College Chicago, which interests, and I'm bringing that in because right before I left Columbia, I taught an August Wilson course, like a, it was a dramatic literature course and we just studied August Wilson's work um, for the entire semester, right? Um, and what I learned there was that students, you know, teaching Wilson for an entire semester allows us to go deeper, obviously, and to bring in critical scholarship um, around Wilson's work um, in African American theater and American theater in general. Um, and students sort of have a great appreciation when they're sort of thinking about and able to engage the cycle from beginning to the end, right? Regardless of how you, how you teach it. And what I mean by that is, I remember being in graduate school, I had a professor, Paul Jackson, who taught, um, we did a graduate seminar on August Wilson, and he taught the plays in terms of when they were written because he wanted us to sort of see the development of Wilson's writing. But oftentimes in undergraduate courses, we'll teach them from Jim in the Ocean, 1904, to Radio Golf, the 1990s play, and I think, was that 1997, 1996, something like that, right? Um, to sort of see the arc of African American history. And so either way it works, right? And then you could do it, you know, thematically, however, you know, um, you like that. And what I find really interesting is that students, um, I always thought that, you know, fences, piano lesson, um, to some degree, two trains are running are a bit more accessible in terms of their relationship with other um, areas of dramatic, uh, you know, other uh, examples of dramatic literature, right? Realism and so forth, right? Where Jim of the Ocean and um, Joe Turner's Come and Gone and even King Headley may be a little bit more complex. And they are, and for many reasons, right? Because they are delving into, um, directly into, you know, some of the Africanisms and so forth that Wilson is attempting to get at. But my point is this, when I teach Jim of the Ocean, that is the play that they connect with most. Because for them, it is doing something powerful and that's what interests them. With Fences, we can talk about Troy, we can talk about Corey, we can talk about father-son relationship, we can talk about the Negro Baseball League and it's, and it's beautiful and it's fascinating. When we're in, but it, it is Jim of the Ocean and Joe Turner's Come and Gone that they find Wilson's work to be not necessarily accessible, but most interesting, right? Because he's doing this kind of what they consider to be this magical work on the stage. And, and, and granted, I'm also teaching theater students who for them, they're always sort of envisioning how will this work on the stage? Who can I play, right? What monologue can I learn? What monologue can I you know, take on to audition with, right? So I also wanna acknowledge that it also depends on what department you're teaching the work in. If that is a conventional, traditional English department and is being taught by someone who is not thinking about it for the stage, but rather as simply literature, Right. Um, and then that, that also makes me think about Sandra L. Richards and her really important essay, you know, when she questions and I got to get the title of the essay, but when she questions, you know, what is missing when we think about these, you know, dramatic texts as simply literature um, and then what gets, you know, um, what gets materialized, right? What what are the uh, um, the, the areas of the, the, the piece of literature that gets sort of emboldened and, and, and enlivened when it is, you know, presented on the stage, right? When bodies are in motion and so forth, yeah. I really would like to pick up on the thread that Sean just left us about the language of the streets. And I hope that Robert won't mind me skipping around in our agenda. No, go for it. But... August Wilson explains how many of his plays begin with a single line of dialogue that then guides his character development. What does his appreciation for the way Black people talk teach us as educators about the value of our students' culturally specific language and dialogue? And how can our appreciation for the way they talk help us guide their character development? I think he, you know, his, his work kind of challenges us to, to reevaluate like how we measure the complexity of language and how we measure the complexity of, of, of vocabulary. Cause you know, so much of, um, I mean, it's not about the words, it's about the ideas. It's about the feelings and how black people express ideas and express feelings and or rather how we find a way to express feelings in complex thoughts within the limitations of whatever system of vocabulary we're giving is kind of part of the genius of black people throughout the world you know and i think that the specificity of his of his language though 
um, how 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 much detail he pays to each to the to the construction of it, and how much detail it demands of the actors to 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 pay attention in um, in constructing the language, also kind of invites us to embrace just the the complexity of of, of how black people engage language. I'll, I'll say that you know, um, speaking as a, a a literary scholar who's teaching in literary studies classrooms, um, this isn't always the case. But to really put an emphasis on students' voices, um, allowing them to be storytellers, um, I think you know so much of our work is built around you know just simply writing an F essay. I shouldn't say simply, but writing an writing essays, um, interpretation, close reading, um, but I'm always trying to get the students' voices into the classroom, um, whether it's through, my students are reading Joe Turner's Come and Gone right now as we speak. This is what we'll be taking up in the next class. And the assignment coming up is a video essay where you are uh, bringing in your own voice, your own body, um, into the practice of close reading. Um, I often have them do autobiographies. I teach classes about like mobility, which might center a historical event like the Great Migration. Like what is your autobiography of mobility or immobility? Have you never left the place where you were born? So, you know, listening to student voices, um, you know, um, and just that, just, that wonderful emphasis and, and everything Wilson does on that, on the language. I mean, I just, dialogue dialogue is king for Wilson and it's, it's that's part of the pleasure of Wilson. Yeah, I would, I would just add briefly that I think it's important to also think about what influenced Wilson um, to people his plays with these particular characters and therefore the ways in which they talk their dialogue as well as their stories, right? Um, you know, we know that Wilson was inspired by the people he lived around, those in Pittsburgh in particular, right? From the diners, right? The community spaces, I'll say. So the diners, the barbershops, the corners, right? The stores, right? Um, and, and so then Wilson moves on and he peoples his play is with what Linda Dickerson would call the dry long so, right? The everyday ordinary people, right? Who are in many ways sort of, um, they're impacted by what's happening socially, culturally, and politically on a national level, right? But that's not the focus of the play. The focus of the play is how do these people survive what's happening nationally, right? Locally, right? Within their communities, which then allows them to sort of talk about the everyday mundane experiences that they're having but the language is beautiful and it's poetic. So it's so August Wilson, you know, then gives us plays that affirms, right, that everyday Black folk, that they are poetic in and of themselves, right, that their language is poetic and beautiful, and that their experiences and their stories, right, and their dialogue, you know, is valued, right? Um, and for me, that's sort of the takeaway uh, uh, for that question. This seems to connect quite fully with the thread of womanism. Can you speak more to how you see womanism showing up in August Wilson's work? I'm thinking about the ordinary everyday and the mobility in our everyday connections. Did anybody wanna jump in first or? Okay, okay. So, so, okay. So I think it's important then to think, you know, largely about Wilson and the ways in which he's been critiqued for the women in his plays, right? And rightly so, nothing and no one is without critique. Um, and many, many scholars have picked up, right? Including Sandra Shannon, um, Dana Owens. Um, I'm thinking about the work of Ladrika Minson Fur. I'm thinking about the new work coming out by um, Leticia Ridley, who has a, a new chapter talking about Wilson, the women in Wilson's work. I um, mean, many, many other scholars and critics and artists who have talked about this, right? Um, and I and I always go back to um, Harry Elam's work, um, scholar Harry Elam's work, where he talks about the women, you know, in Wilson's work. And that is, you know, you know, we can critique Wilson for the development of the women, for you know, the ways in which he depicts them, right? And the argument is simply this: the fact that they're flat, they're they they're not given as much stage time and presence and dialogue, or specifically, you know, language um, and script 
as the men, right? Um, and that there is a kind of reliance upon men within the plays, right? In terms of the women and their, uh, uh, how they're sort of portrayed and developed. But Her Elam offers a really sort of nuanced idea and that is this, right? While, you know, first and foremost, we have to pick up, you know, his plays in terms of its historical and social context, right? So it's really, it's easy to take today's theoretical and cultural frameworks and apply them to the past, you know, in which Wilson is dealing with within his plays, right? But he also talks about the idea that the women, they really have a greater function. And if we look closely at sort of how they're sort of participating in the community within the plays, right? So I'll think about two trains running. I'll think about Risa, who plays um, the, the, the waitress in Two Trains Running, in the, in the diner, right? And throughout the play, Risa, give me some sugar, Risa, give me some sugar, Risa, give me some sugar, right? Um, and then there are moments where Memphis, who owns the diner, comes in, and he's, you know, sort of not berating her, but in a sort of aggressive, assertive manner, sort of, Risa, where is this and what's that? Turn the fire down, cook the, you know, you got to put that chicken on, you know, get the ribs going. You know, he's sort of, you know, telling her, but he's the boss of the diner. And sort of, so he's, he's also sort of asserting a kind of, a, a sort of kind of, dominance, right? Um, an attitude that this is my place and I'm going to run it how I want to run it. But here's what we know. Take Risa out the play, take Risa out the diner, it would fall apart. And so while Risa doesn't necessarily assert a kind of response often to him, you know, verbally, her response is literally in the physical work and the labor she carries out in the diner. So if she was absent, the diner would fall apart, and the play ultimately would fall apart and we would need to set the play somewhere else, right? That is her place, if that makes sense, right? I often think about, um, let's talk about fences really quickly, right? And um, uh, Rose Maxson, the wife of Troy in the play. You know, Troy is this big stern figure. He is this dominant figure. He's aggressive, he's assertive, right? Um, perhaps the most uh, uh, flawed character throughout Wilson's Ufer. Right, um, and really a character that I think competes, as we know, Wilson wrote this play to be, you know, to sort of compete and be paralleled with other great American uh, dramatic works, predominantly by other white European playwrights, right? Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill, and so forth. But here's one, something that oftentimes gets overlooked, especially in classrooms. Troy is illiterate and cannot read, something that he admits later on, which is how he ends up signing papers that uh, allows his brother Gabriel to be sent to a permanent home, a permanent you know, hospital, right, where he'll stay. And this happens later in the play. Every Friday he gives Rose his paycheck. And, she, and, and what we learn is that Rose is sort of taking care of the household, bills and so forth, right? What I think is important is to recognize Rose is not illiterate, she can read. Right. So she's also the one who has to take care of the everyday you know, activities to maintain the household, which, again, sort of illustrates that if she's pulled out, if she's taken away. Right. That home would fall apart. And I think also she is the one that held Troy up. And, and, and I'm going to acknowledge that I want us to all acknowledge, you know, the gender dynamics that's playing out there. Right. But I don't mean simply in this kind of emotional way. I'm talking about literally the one who's able to carry out the daily functions because he's living in a world where he can't fully participate because of his illiteracy. Right. And so I just want to give just two examples of the ways in which women participate and function, you know, in the play. Um, and there's many, many, many more. Right. But those are the two that I'll give for now. I would jump along uh, Dr. Long's comments as well. I mean, as a director, I mean, one of the things that I found a lot working with actors um, on the plays is how much space there is for uh, the women to kind of fill these voids that that people, you know, kind of criticize him for not for not giving them so many words, and particularly like Rissa in two trains running um you know one of the the actors who played that role melissa clark is on this call i got to give her a shout out she's an amazing amazing actor and was working with her on the role and we had conversations about about this you know about like oh wow she doesn't have that many lines as, as the other guy she doesn't have these big speeches but we really found like how much acting moments she had just occupying the space and you know and how much she does really 
keep that place running and just the nuances that Melissa was able to find as as an actor in, in in creating these these moments with these actors was was just infinitely rich you know so i think oftentimes we 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 think it kind of gets at like for me as a director what is the play oftentimes we think the script is the play but the script is not the play the script is a literary piece of work the play is a living moving thing that only exists in a finite time and then it closes and then it's gone until somebody brings the play to life again the, the it's a play is a very elusive thing that no one can really own the play even the author themselves even that's kind of the magic of, of theater it, it you you know a great writer creates these spaces for other artists to come in and breathe nuances that they they might not have even figured out and i feel like at one level august wilson kind of even and he talks about recognizes his own shortcomings in trying to like articulate everything that's going on inside of a woman instead of him trying to like write write it there he just left space for people to kind of come in actors to come in and, and kind of put of themselves in the role in a way that i think it's hard to appreciate until you really dive in to staging the text I'll just briefly add that, um, you know, I'm thinking of, of Rose and Fences and Bertha and Two Trains Running. So there are moments where um, women um, have voice. Um, but I also, you know, coming from the literary um, canon and approaching, you know, drama first as literary text. Um, but often as well as a performative text that um, I'm thinking of something like Song of Solomon, Toni Morrison's 1977 novel, which, you know, has lots of correspondences with um, uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone, um, the story of migration. Um, but the question with both of these texts, um, Morrison's and Wilson's, is, um, is the aim to be a mimetic text to represent or mirror, uh, you know, reality, um, the world that we live in, which is patriarchal, um, or is there something disruptive there? I mean, both of those, you know, kind of goals for the text are um, useful, um, even if it is just mirroring what happens in the Jitney station or the restaurant or the boarding house, um, there's, there's use there to be able to critique the relationships and the power dynamics there. I also, I also wanna um, jump in if I can, um, and Ari to, to think a little bit about your question specifically around womanism, right? Um, I don't know if I would consider Wilson work to be, you know, feminist, you know, or an example of Black feminist or womanist works. But if we think about womanism, particularly thinking about um, Laley Phillips, right, and, you know, her definition around the idea of womanism, then I think that, in, in particular, I'm thinking about womanism, you know, this notion that Black women should be at the center but Black women should be at the center because then, therefore, we can think about the larger community. Wilson's work, again, is really invested, you know, he's really invested in the idea of the entire community, you know, um, um, being at the center of the discourse, um, seeking freedom and liberation, right, seeking, seeking retribution, right, um, seeking survivorship and so forth. Um, so I think that that is an interesting way to sort of branch off and think about it, right, without dismissing you know, or without not engaging in the critiques um, that have been published about Wilson and the ways in which he depicts women within his works as well. Yeah. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah, there, there's a question in the chat that says, do we think that it was a cultural norm that women weren't given much attention at the time or August Wilson was just misrepresenting women? I mean, I, you know, I, I don't know if I would say August Wilson was was misrepresenting women in terms of August Wilson was 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 um, kind of like giving his perspective, sharing. And that's all an artist can really do 
is share their perspective on a thing and then it does open it's fair game to criticize i feel like it's fair game to to have conversations about like what's effective and what's not effective or what's offensive or what's what's empowering all of that is good stuff you know in terms of but but trying to throw august wilson's work away because it's not you know feminist enough or it doesn't center you know black women enough i would i would take issue with, with that you know um but i, I feel like it, yeah it, it's healthy for us to to talk about what what works particularly as you know as time goes by when we look at works from the past we have different standards we, we you know we think of feminism very differently now than we did in the, in the 80s and stuff so as as time goes by we we got to keep these conversations going in you know in, in looking at these texts but not throwing them away we still can recognize their merits with while you know kind of questioning some of the things within them can I can I jump in and add a little bit to that and respond to that a little bit and particularly the question I saw the question as well. I think first first of all it's important to acknowledge that Wilson you know has spoken on this right and what he has said for um um is that you know the, he models the women in his plays and in particular rose from fences after his mother Daisy Wilson right and so again you know um you know similar to what Professor Mick is getting to is the idea that he's model he's creating off of what he knows. And what is his experience? He often he's his, he has also argued that he doesn't want to depict women, right? Because he's not one. He doesn't identify one. He doesn't know their experiences. So again, he's writing culturally, right? And from a gendered perspective, what he knows and what he has experienced himself, right? But I, I and I used to be one of those folks, especially when I was in graduate school. Many of us, you know, when we're in grad school, we kind of try to challenge all of the readings and find the flaws and the argument rather than sort of recognize and appreciate what the argument and or the work is attempting to do in the first place right and that's something that I try to get my students to do now I always say to them you know when like when I'm teaching um, theater and we're using plays as an example or something to explore something that has happened in theater history and so forth I always tell them I don't care if you liked it or did not like it that does nothing for us it's unproductive to think in those ways right what is what is the work attempting to do Let's start there, right? And so for me, if we think about Wilson and how he's attempting to chronicle the Black experience through a particular time period, I think then the goal is to put Wilson in conversation with other people who have also attempted to do such a project. And maybe even think about Wilson as a front runner or as a pioneer or as someone who sort of opened the door for these kinds of works to be taken up in, in, in commercial theater, right? Um, so, for instance, I'm thinking about Dominique Mariso, who is also who's another African American woman playwright, who has also written a cycle of her own, and she's chronicling, you know, the Black experience in Detroit, right? So, again, thinking about the ways in which the plays are set in a very particular location, right, throughout various time periods. But what Dominique Mariso does differently is that she puts women at the center of these plays. Right. So, again, she's someone who's taking up, you know, and, and I also want to acknowledge and Dominic Mariso has said this herself, that Wilson is an inspiration, but also Pearl Clegg is an inspiration. Right. So and Pearl Clegg is also someone who has done this as well. Right. Looking at various moments throughout history. Right. And people in her place to sort of respond to what's been happening socially, culturally and politically. But again, like like like, you know, very much inspired by Pearl Clegg, who she considers a mentor, you know, Pearl Clegg herself putting women at the center of these plays. Right. So I, I think, you know, I, I'm not saying that the, that the critiques are not valid, but I'm not invested in continuing having that conversation because Wilson is one person and he's not the, he's not a standalone playwright who has attempted to chronicle black experience through dramatic literature. We can look to many others who are writing prior to Wilson and at the same time as Wilson doing something very similar. And if we want to sort of a more of a nuanced, you know, approach with regards to gender, look at some of the other folks. And the last person I'll mention who does something quite similar is Lynn Nottage. Again, while she's not sort of doing um, a chronological purview uh, like Wilson, right, sort of this lineage like Wilson, well, she does offer a sort of a genealogical view by, by writing these plays that are set at various times throughout you know, American history where women, again, are at the center, right? And so I think really it's just, you know, who else can we look to and then put Wilson in conversation with those people rather than thinking about Wilson as sort of a standalone artist um, who has to bear that burden, yeah. Thank you for all of these responses. Um... This is giving me a lot to think about as someone who also looks at womanism and community in my own research. 
And just, I guess, shifting slightly from maybe like gender specific theory to a broader question about identity. I do want us, I want to pose a question about black theater um, broadly. So I'm thinking more along the lines of what Justin had shared earlier about there being like this default universal idea of theater and then there being black theater on the margins. And so Wilson's stated position on theater was based on W.E.B. Du Bois's principles. The plays of a true black theater must be one, about us, two, by us, three, for us, and four, near us. With this in mind, I really want to know what you all think black theater looks like today um, and how we can juxtapose contemporary offerings with Wilson's productions to raise consciousness within and um, in our culture. So what does black theater look like today if um, we're moving it to the center, if we're thinking about it as a central theme in our everyday lives? And how do we juxtapose today's offerings with Wilson's um, unique specificity around Black theater as a mode of consciousness raising? So one of the reasons that um, Wilson insisted on these principles laid out by Du Bois is um, the very fact of uh, the conditions of Black theater, theater in the United States. So um, he had the famously had a debate um, about this with um, one of the kind of the theater um, uh, organizers in New York, um, and he was insistent that um, we need to focus on about us, by us, for us, and near us because there is a dearth of Black theater uh, uh, houses uh, devoted to Black theater in the United States. So that was the case in uh, 1997. Um, and he was talking about the stats, like one out of 64. Um, even though we've had like a wonderful Broadway you know, kind of a flourishing of Black theater um, in recent years. Um, you know, it was only in 2020 that um, there, uh, there was a organizing around Broadway for racial justice and kind of documenting, um, you know, the widespread racism in the industry. So, you know, that still marks contemporary theater and Black theater um, to this day. I think that it's, it's interesting. Uh, the question that you pose, Ari, is, is similar to a question. It was I'm, I just did a, a forum on Black theater performance, and it was a similar question posed, and it got me thinking about it. And I think one way to think about well, before I answer that specifically, I want to um, sort of think about um, uh, what Professor Myers was just giving us, right, and thinking about Du Bois, right, as sort of a pioneer and really sort of, I guess, a progenitor of of, of you know, a black theater aesthetic, if you will, you know, sort of a theoretical framework to think about the purpose of black theater and performance in America, right? But I also want to acknowledge that in, in particular thing about Wilson, who uh, names the black arts movement as a very important um, moment for his life, as well as an inspiration for his work, to think about how Amir Baraka pushed forward Du Bois's principles, right? About us, for us, near us, um, um, and really added a fifth principle, many would argue, and that is that Black theater should be liberating as well, right? And I think in many ways that is what August Wilson is attempting to do with his work, right? But, you know, to think, to think a little bit more closely about the question, I think that what we are witnessing today is kind of like a Black cultural renaissance, right, that expands on, you know, both the politics um, and the aesthetics that were innovated during, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, um, um, of the early 20th century, um, the Black arts movement of the 1960s, um, Black feminist movement of the 1970s, right? And so in many ways, I think Black theater today maintains the traditions, and that is of amplifying um, voices of some of the most vulnerable, you know, uh, communities and the people within those communities. Um, I think that Black theater today inspires and it entertains. Um, it's intellectual. Um, I think that it offers relief from the pressures of social and, and personal responsibilities, and therefore we can appreciate theater and performance as a form of entertainment, right, as a way to sort of remove ourselves from, 
the pressures of everyday life, right? Because sometimes you do want to go to the theater and just simply have a good time at the theater and see a good show. Oftentimes I go to the theater and I find myself, you know, delving in intellectually, and then it feels like work for me, right? Um, and, you know, that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? Um, I think that Black theater today is embracing inclusivity and equity um, on a larger scale. And it's and Black theater in particular is becoming a model for how that can happen in mainstream American theater as well as in academic theater. Um, Black theater today is boldly queer, right? And I think that Black theater today gives new meaning to the phrase, I'm here to stay, right? Um, and I would like to think that August Wilson is sort of a pioneer in opening that space for Black artists to come in and create the kind of works that, can, that are continuing to show those who have rarely been shown in theater, literature, media, and so forth, yeah. Yeah, I think this um, you know, the idea of Black theater by us, for us, near us. I mean, at one level today, the idea of us is a little bit more abstracted than I think it was historically, you know? I mean, the community was much more kind of polarized. It was very clear what was Black, what was white in ways that it, we don't operate around those strict polarities is, is from the past anymore the way right in one way it, it's a, a benefit you know and sometimes it makes things kind of harder to build consensus as a quote unquote black community because there is so much so many different layers of of blackness and so many ideas of of what it even means to to be black you know i mean is is if candace owens puts on a, a play is that is that black theater is is justice Clarence Thomas is he a black Supreme Court justice you know I mean th there's all these kind of things that are <laughs> in question you know so it's not just okay a, a black person doing it makes makes it black so to speak you know I mean so for me myself I, I try and think about and, and this I, I take inspiration from August Wilson I feel like he was much more trying to point us towards a legacy uh, you know, align ourselves with with a cultural legacy that he wasn't necessarily tr trying to be clearly definitive of, but just point us in a direction towards looking to the past towards a cultural legacy that we all share. And it, it doesn't have these hard defined rules. And, you know, very early on, um, August Wilson was was kind of playing with that in terms of Ma Rainey's sexuality and, and Hambone's mental health. And, you know, I mean, so he, he was showing us this very complex black community, even though it was contained in the, the Hill District, it was international in mind school. It was, you know, so all these things. So I, I really try and think, for me, in terms of black theater being something where black culture, black cultural legacy is at the center of the storytelling, you know, um, that's how I tend to, to work with, with and define it now. Thank you for acknowledging that, right? I, I often, you know, when I have heard critiques around um, this idea that August Wilson doesn't people his plays with queer characters, and I go, well, not necessarily so, right? Um, I often think that, you know, there are many characters in the play that in his plays that could possibly be queer. He just haven't, he just did not delve into those possibilities. But we always forget about Ma Rainey, right? His right? first play. That's his first play. You know, that's the play that catapulted him to fame, right? Um, and, and really made him an award-winning playwright, right? And not only does she sort of give us, you know, not only does he depict um, and illustrate Ma Rainey's queerness, but I, and I'm using queerness specifically. He's with the character Dusty May. He's talking about the fluidity of sexuality, right? And I don't know if he knew, if he recognized that that he was doing that, but that's important, right? And then how do we then take that thread and then just sort of recognize how that was a possibility and now how it is materialized in the work of many contemporary playwrights and in particular Black playwrights today, you know, I just thank you for acknowledging that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists at these, um, I would say really critically engaging responses. We've, you've really generated much discussion in the Q&A. 
And I would Absolutely. like to transition. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of movement here, a lot yes. of thinking that's happening. Um, it's actually really exciting because it's it's spanning the um, many areas of this conversation from like pedagogy to place making to gender and memory. But I do want to start with um, Kirsten's question, Kirsten Scott, um, because it kind of brings us back to this last question I posed about like black theater. Um, and I'm thinking of this question as like a place making question as well. She says, I'd like to build on two themes that Dr. Myers posed. Those of the autobiography of mobility and mimetic possibilities of Wilson's work. If we imagine, and she believes we can, Wilson's cycle of plays as a place-based autobiography slash biography of Black life in Pittsburgh, what mirrors are made possible and what mirrors are shattered as it relates to views of Black life in Pittsburgh today? Ooh, I love that, shattering mirrors. Said another way, what do Wilson's cycle of plays challenge us to think about contemporary Black life in Pittsburgh? Um, I'll say this question felt particularly poignant to me because of that near us component of Du Bois's um, Black theater description. So I'll say just to lead us off that um, and thinking about what mirrors are made possible and what mirrors are shattered as it relates to views of Black life in Pittsburgh today. So, I mean, it is wonderful that we have the August Wilson Center here, the August Wilson House, and now the August Wilson Archive. Um, but I think that we also need to think about how are we keeping August Wilson alive in our schools? Um, you know, um, what does the literature course, the drama um, class look like um, at the high school level? Um, I, from what I have seen, there seems to be an absence of, you know, we have Weidman, we have Wilson, we have um, Teeny Harris, and, you know, you know, a whole range of like musical icons in the history of Pittsburgh. And how are those things kept alive? How are we mirroring those things? Um, uh, if we are talking about this legacy of self-determination and self-awareness, um, have we kind of not emphasized this type of history and legacy within our um, educational spaces? Um, you know. Thank you. Um, I I could also share my thoughts if the panel is okay. Like that. Oh, okay. So this also makes me think about um, when I first got to Pittsburgh, uh, a professor said to me that Pittsburgh statistically is one of the widest metropolitan cities in the country um, because there's less people of color and more white people um, per capita in the city. And I think referencing the what mirrors the shatters part of Kirsten's question, I think the presence of August Wilson in Pittsburgh, the way in which he documents Black life in Pittsburgh really shatters this perception that many people have of Pittsburgh being a white city. Um, I do think like culturally, there are questions, marks about how it's portrayed, um, I guess like economically, how it's portrayed politically in a broader sense. But when we're really thinking about like, art as culture when we're thinking about the ordinary and how that keeps a city alive and it keeps it functioning, I do think it shatters this idea that Pittsburgh is a white city because so much of Black life and Black culture is what's undergirding Pittsburgh's entire existence as um, a place worth considering in drama, in arts, in literature. Um, is Black people putting Pittsburgh on the map in very specific and targeted ways. Yeah, I mean, to, and to that, you know, building on, on that idea, similar is, is the idea that that kind of a numerical count is how we determine how black or how white a, a city is, you know, I mean, because in, in the same side, in sense, is America a white nation, or, you know, when when black culture is at the root and the foundation and the bedrock of, of American culture, you know, but if again, if you're just counting numbers of it, 
you know that that's also a very a, a political strategy to use num numerics you know to kind of define the majority and the minority which is what you know i know many of our parents really cringed at the idea of being called minorities because it just suggested the idea of because you're numerically lower you're you're lesser of, of importance within society and so you know august wilson's legacy in pittsburgh kind of forces the city to confront i mean it's it, you know it's black culture that in a lot of ways has helped put Pittsburgh on the map in many different arenas, not every arena, but many different arenas, you know, and so how we value again black culture black life and how we center it um, is important for us to, to, you know, kind of always keep at the forefront. That reminds me of uh, Ralph Ellison's essay, which I think is titled, What Would America Be Without Blacks? where he does this kind of thought experiment, extracting Black culture from history, politics, literature. And his conclusion is much of nothing is what it would be. And so you cannot really pull us or um, relegate us to a number when we're talking about uh, the makeup of the country. Thank you. I think you can also include um a play, uh, I think it was Douglas Turner Ward's play, D Day of Absence, right? <laughs> which I remember we did that when I was in college, um, which is a play that the black folks disappear for the day, right? And white folks are sort of scrambling to survive um, and, and carry out their daily mundane, you know, activities. Uh, yeah. Wow. Okay, I need to read that. <laughs> there is another question here from Kevin Mosley, and I like this question. Um, Mosley says, Wilson was inspired by the activist activism of Romare Bearden, i.e. the piano lesson. What other Black artists and musicians did he draw inspiration from? And I think that kind of connects to another question that was there as well. Anonymous, yeah. there's been no mention. I don't know, Dr. Long, if you want to respond. Yeah, um, you know, so oftentimes, you know, we think about Wilson and the Bees. Sometimes it's the three Bs, sometimes it's the four Bs. So there's Romare Beard, a visual artist. Um, um, Wilson was inspired by his collage-like work. Um, um, in particular, Piano Lesson, Jill Turner's Come and Gone. Uh, and I, I forgot the other play where there were direct correlation between Bearden's work and Wilson's plays um, in terms of where Wilson was, you know, takes the title of his plays from Bearden's work. Um, there's also um, Amir Baraka, right, Black Arts Movement. Um, there's also, in terms of the bees, there's also Jorge Luis Borges, some people say Borges, I always say Borges, that's how I heard it, and it was taught to me, um, who was a um, uh, uh, Argentinian, I, God, I, I can't remember, writer. Um, and Wilson was inspired by the ways in which he used these, what, what people consider to be these fantastical elements in his work, such as ghosts and trips to the past. But of course, Wilson, you know, when he sort of, you know, was influenced and borrows these tropes within Borges' work, he uh, very much sort of, you know, Africanized um, or, you know, sort of recognized the Africanisms within the idea of a trip to the past or this idea of a ghost. And so for Wilson, it's very much in the context of ancestors, you know, ancestors, right, and so forth, right? Um, and I think the only direct correlation with this idea of a ghost is with the ghost of Sutter in the piano lesson. Um, and then the other Bs, there is um, the blues, right? Wilson, you know, I think if, if we know nothing else about Wilson, we know that the blues was at the center of his work both as a musical genre, as well as a philosophical system, right? Um, as a method in which Black folks use to, um, to, to, to express their vulnerabilities, right? And where they were at that time. And in particular, it wasn't Ma Rainey in particular, it was actually Bessie Smith, who was Wilson's inspiration and connection to the blues. So those are the sort of the, the main four Bs that we often think about. And Wilson later on adds two more Bs, and that's Ed Bullins, the playwright um, from the Black Arts Movement, and not only the Black Arts Movement, but a pioneering figure in the Black Arts Movement, um, who also set out to write 
um, a, you know, a, a cycle of plays that documents the African-American experience. And the other one was James Baldwin. So we think about Wilson and then the four Bs, but also adding on the two other Bs, right? And I think his work though, inherently um, demands we, we, we take a closer look at the context that created his work. And largely because he dealt so much with metaphors and, and po you know and poetry that um, one is so brilliant about his work, I think, is how specific it is, but also still how abstract it is, you know? So like even in, in a play like um, Two Trains Running, which is kind of one of his most realistic plays, you know, he has you dealing with West, who was an actual figure who actually lived, who had the funeral home. You know, one time, you know, the, the West family criticized him for the de depiction of West. You know, and his response was, well, there's more than one West, you know, and so basically, again, he he's taking license. He's not trying to 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 to, you know, kind of be so specific as say this is history in writing, you know, so there's this kind of abstraction that kind of pulls you in to want to know well, where where are these philosophies coming from? And there's a lot of them that are informed from Bessie Smith to Malcolm X to the Nation of Islam to Elijah Muhammad that are kind of woven little in, into his work, you know? And without it, if you don't do that work, you're really not gonna understand or appreciate half of what the play is about. Wow, okay. Uh... You all are giving me a lot to think about and a lot to explore um, as we are, you know, going through these questions. One of the very first questions we got, um, and it speaks to, I think, something Professor, to a point Professor Myers made about, um, you know, incorporating the arts and what happens when we strip the arts away from school. Someone, a Kip Dawson said, please comment on the potential or importance of having middle school students um, do August Wilson's work. I snuck in doing so as a middle school English teacher beginning the year he died with piano lesson using the PBS video, but then snuck in having my students work on scenes and monologues. Piano lesson, Fences, and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom all resonated with them, and doing and doing this work was a growing experience, particularly following work with Shakespeare. And thank you for, so much for uh, the conversation today. I think it's interesting that the, the, the verb snuck, like I had to sneak yeah. in yeah. and do that. And I think a lot of particularly public school teachers do a lot of that. Yeah, that's what I was going to start to ask, and maybe we won't get a response, but, you know, where did the need to sneak this come in from, and is the curriculum not, you know, broad enough to accommodate, is it, you know, some type of violation to actually bring August Wilson in, um, you know, these are all questions for a school board and superintendent, but. I think this question could also be paired with a question from Brianna, um, just thinking about how we move these things to the center. And Brianna writes, regarding Khalid's answer about teaching art at the center of the curriculum as opposed to at the periphery, love that. How do you make that happen? I think for us as humanists and artists, the importance of the arts is obvious, but we're increasingly going against the grain. And I think maybe that's what Kip Dawson is getting at, is having had to go against the grain very intentionally. And so maybe it feels like a sneaking, it feels like a subversion. Um, if it's not already um, defaultly placed on our syllabus or a teaching guide. Are there pragmatic strategies to get school systems and parents to value arts education? Brianna also says thanks because they realize this is a tough question. I, I think that, so I teach on the college level. I also want to acknowledge that I have a little bit more leeway with curriculum. Um, I'm also someone who does curriculum development, so I can kind of like go in and you know do some things. I, but I also taught in middle school and high school at one time. And I don't know if I'm invested in getting parents to get on board anymore. And the re let me name what I'm, let me, let me be very clear what I'm saying here. I don't know if I have the energy or the time, the capacity and where we are today 
to convince parents that literature that has existed for hundreds of years is valuable. If I got to spend time convincing you of that, then that takes up my time for actually teaching your child, number one. My goal is to actually penetrate the mind of the young folks in my classroom so that they, they can then go home and go to their communities and teach their people. That's me. And I, I want to name that's my philosophy. I'm not asking anybody to take that up. I'm not saying that that's the only way to do that, right? Because I'm also thinking about who's going to be leading us and teaching folks and my children in the future. And it is the people that, that I'm teaching now, right? Um, I will say also that uh, I do a yearly teaching August Wilson workshop at the Goodman Theater, which was initiated by Willa Taylor, um, the director of audience engagement um, and community outreach at the Goodman Theater. Um, and that I think is a model for how that's done. And, and, and specifically the Teaching August Wilson workshop is not about teaching college professors how to teach it, it is about teaching grade school teachers. So in specifically Chicago public school teachers, how to teach and engage with Wilson's work in the classrooms beyond fences and the piano lesson. Um, and so really it's about cultural competency um, and then it's about developing the language and the skills um, you know, and the know-how, right, to include it in the curriculum. And once you sort of have an understanding of what Wilson is attempting to do, you can then sort of fight back and resist the dominant forces and vis-a-vis -vis the administrators who say you should not include this because of these reasons and so forth. Um, and I think the, and to sort of summarize all, to sum all that up, I think it really is about having a greater appreciation for Black folk and their art. You cannot, you know, we often, I get these folks who are sort of saying, I want to teach this play, I think we should. And you should, but why? Do you even have an appreciation for Black folks and their art at large, right? Because once you do, I don't know if the struggle for reworking the curriculum and putting Black folk and their art at the center would be as hard as it may be now. So I think it really is some internal things that we got to work through as well. Our own, and I'm talking about Black folk, white folk, Asian, whoever, it's our own internalized, you know, anti-Blackness that we have to work through as well to have a greater appreciation for some of the work that we don't teach or that we feel as though we got to sneak in. Um, and then that gives us sort of a greater, um, I think, response to the folks who do control the curriculum and so forth. When we have that voice and we're allowed to sort of push back and so forth. You know, I think a lot of this is too, a little bit getting at this idea of universal education. Like it, it, it's very kind of, European in terms of like education being this factual based thing. So that's like, let's read about these facts that are agreed upon and we read a book that tell us the facts of what happened, right? When one that's problematic in and of itself, because there's no book that's going to give you from history a factual account. Inherently, we becoming we're, we're, we're diving into somebody's politics when we read their history book, you know, and is what's African in terms of education is that stories are are the education right we know that the griots in West Africa would educate the people by telling them stories that remind them of who they are and where they are the where their place in the world is. And I think you know that some of these ideas are starting to come into to, to education in people's classrooms in terms of like so w instead of thinking like we, we need a a factual uh, a, you know kind of textbook to talk about the civil rights movement, we could have a play we could we could take a play and read the play. And that's gonna that's gonna take us into the civil rights movement, and it's gonna take us from a first person perspective. That's one of the powerful things about art, and you know, students reading, becoming these characters because they they become these characters. They walk in the shoes of these characters, and they can empathize and and feel the lives of these and the struggles of these characters in a way that you can't really do when you're reading a history book that's just kind of telling factual accounts of what happened this there and that you know so the more that we use art at the center of the curriculum to get at the same issues right as opposed to thinking well we need to start with a factual non-biased account which is impossible to do and then you know kind of sprinkle a little art to, to flavor it up we can we can flip that over we could do the opposite let's let's just deal with all art 
you know, with just the music of the time, the art, the, the visual arts of the time, the plays of the time, and then also supplement it with some kind of factual accounts from other people, you know, but again, recognizing that there is no such thing as universal education, universal facts, universal history. I wanted to say that uh, Kip came back with some additional information, Kip Dawson, um, and they said, I use SNUC because public schools increasingly have been under pressure to stick to test preparation and arts and the arts all have been pushed out, not okay. Um, they additionally say everything uh, you have presented here is relevant to the question. And as an educator who works with these children, I am most grateful, thanks a lot. Lots to think about. I'll just say thank you Kip, for coming back to give us more information, but you know, uh, on my end of this problem, you know, the college classroom, you know, teaching African American literature, you know, semester in and semester out, you know, one of the very first questions I ask on day one is um, how many of you all have, you know, read these texts before, before we get into each text, you know, Toni Morrison, the Song of Solomon, how many of you have read this, you know, um, increasingly um, and, and in an ongoing way, very few students who arrive in my college classes have had some past experience, you know, outside of one Toni Morrison text or um, one James Baldwin essay. Um, so, you know, thank you for the sneaking. Um, yeah. I think we are coming to an end, unfortunately, of this discussion. This was very powerful. And I will turn this over to Ari. Yes, thank you. So I want to thank everyone for coming, um, especially our esteemed panelists. And I want to thank everyone for the comments and questions in the chat and the Q&A. Um, you've given the panelists and facilitators much to think about. Um, so it feels like a reciprocal energy throughout today's event. We want to encourage you all to sign up for the Center for Urban Education's listserv on our website in order to continue receiving information and invitations to our 20th anniversary events. So we thank you again for coming and we look forward to all the work you will do to move Black Theater, August Wilson, and all of the named poets and inspirations from the periphery to the center in your classrooms and in your daily lives. So thank you all.